Hey, I'm Tad, the associate pastor here at Wilkesboro Baptist Church, and thank you for joining us for this recorded service online. If you would like more information about our service times where you could come join us in person, you can see those at wilkesborobaptist.org, or you can email us at info at wilkesborobaptist.org. We hope that you enjoy it. God bless. We're going to open with Come Christians Join the Sing. Good. Thanks for singing with us this morning. Uh, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 2. I'm going to ask if you would. Uh, we'll read that text in just a moment. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever had a situation where you were supposed to meet somebody and that person made you wait? Uh, that A lot of times that happens to illustrate or make clear a power dynamic, right? Where the person who has more authority and power in the particular situation make someone else wait on them. I remember that taking place when I was a college student. Uh, we would uh, be at North Greenville University getting ready to go to class or being in class, and we'd sit in class on time, right? We were on time, sitting down in there, and the professor wasn't there. And our kind of subtle rule as students was to give any professor 10 minutes and to give a professor with a doctorate 15 that was kind of our rule. Uh, but anyway, we understand that that happens when meetings take place. I just want to remind you that God is not sitting in a heavenly boardroom waiting on us to come to Him. God initiated the meeting with people. He stepped out of where He was and came to where we were. And Hebrews 2 is all about that. It's about the idea that God came down in human flesh to meet with people like you and like me. God meets us at Christmas. Let's read this text of Scripture. Hebrews 2, beginning in verse 1, Therefore we must pay closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord and was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to His will. Now it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come of which we are speaking. 
It has been testified somewhere, that somewhere, by the way, is Psalm 8, if you want to read the whole text later. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside of his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified have one origin. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of your congregation. I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to a lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels to, angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Beautiful text of Scripture. Memory verse comes from this passage of Scripture that helps us understand and make sense of what it means that Jesus came to us at Christmas. He came in flesh and blood. He came as God incarnate in order to bring about salvation. He came uh, for several reasons. First, He meets us with a message of salvation. With a message of salvation. Did you catch verses 1 through 4 there? It said, pay attention. Pay attention to what you've heard. Uh, lest we drift away. Now, I'm going to come back in a few weeks, probably after the first of the year, and, and uh, preach a specific message on the falling away passages of the book of Hebrews. There are several warnings, several drifting passages or falling away passages, and we're going to look at them as an entire unit in a few weeks. So I'm not going to deal with this text as deeply as I might otherwise, but in, in this particular instance, what the writer is telling us is to pay attention to what we've heard so that we don't drift away, so that we don't wander away from our faith. And so there's a warning there, and we'll discuss it in brief in a moment, but there's a warning in this passage of Scripture. Nevertheless, what it is, verse 2, we're to pay attention to what? We're to pay attention to the message declared, for the message declared by angels proved to be reliable. In other words, the Old Testament... And that's what the writer did in chapter 1. He acknowledged the Old Testament came through angelic witness. That message is reliable. So the writer of the book of Hebrews is telling us that the Old Testament is reliable. So God-inspired word is telling us the God-inspired word is reliable. That's an encouragement to our faith. So then he goes on to say, uh, if that message proved reliable and the transgressions against God's law in the Old Testament warrant judgment, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? In other words, his point is, arguing from the, the lesser to the greater, if in the Old Testament God judged those who ignored his word, how much more will God judge those who hear about Christ and ignore Christ? That's why he asked that question. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? In verse 4, or the latter part of verse 3, it was declared to us first by the Lord, do you realize that the first one to declare the message of salvation, the full message of salvation, was Jesus himself? Jesus came to meet us first and foremost with a message of salvation. Now that should be tremendously encouraging because at Christmas we think about Jesus coming as God incarnate. We think about Jesus coming as a baby, being laid in a manger. We reflect on those sentimental moments, those gloriously wonderful moments when the shepherds came, like we sang about earlier. When the angels announced Jesus' entry into the world, like we sang about. We think about the wise men. We think about Jesus' life and ministry. And if you're anything like me as a Christian, you've wondered over the years, what would it have been like to have been there? 
when Jesus walked on water or when he raised Jairus' daughter or cast demons out of the demoniac or any number of the miracle stories. And if we're not careful, what we might do is wonder, man, wouldn't my faith be stronger if I were there meeting Jesus in person? I just want you to know, we're to pay attention to the message declared by the Lord. Listen, salvation comes through meeting Jesus. Jesus fills us with his Holy Spirit, convicts us. We can meet him personally. But we do not have to be in the very physical presence of Jesus 2,000 years ago in order to know salvation. That's encouraging, folks, because we don't have to transport ourselves back in the past in order to meet the God who is in the present with us. It was declared by the Lord. It's a message that he gave us, the gospel of the kingdom. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It was also attested by those who heard, meaning the apostles heard it. They proclaimed it. And the writer of the book of Hebrews is one of those. God also bore witness to the word that he spoke through Jesus in particular. How? In verse 4, by signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts by the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. And so what are we to do? Christian, we're to pay attention. We're to pay attention. You know, the best way not to fall away is to pay attention to what God has already said. The most important thing that we can do as followers of Jesus is to pay careful and close attention to the Scripture that He's given us. Because drift, drifting away, folks, is a dangerous reality and possibility. I've watched it happen in people's lives. And it's not like they wake up one morning. And some do, but most don't do this. Wake up one morning and say, I'm going to reject Christianity. I hate everything I heard for 50 years of my life, and I'm just done with it, and I'm walking away. That's not what happens most of the time. You know what happens most of the time? Somebody wakes up one Sunday morning and they say, I'm a little tired today. I don't think I'm going to go to church. And it's easier not to go the next week because they didn't go this past week. And then it's easier not to go after that. And then, and then pretty soon because they're, they're not attending church and hearing the encouraged community of God's people sing and pray and praise and worship together, they stop reading the Bible. And then they stop reading the Bible and maybe a son or a daughter or a friend tells them about this newfangled idea or really it's not a new idea, it's an old idea to, to show deception or, show, or to claim that somehow the Bible is not true. And so they start hearing that and le reading a little bit here and reading a little bit there. And then they wonder, was it ever real what I had? Did it, did it ever really matter? And, and pretty soon after a couple of years of not being around God's people and not being in God's Word and hearing alternative ideas, they wake up one morning and they're not a Christian by any measure of what the Bible says a follower of Christ is to be in relation to bearing fruit. Got to be aware that drifting away is a dangerous possibility. Let me read two quotes and then we'll move on to the next point. Thomas Schreiner in his commentary on the book of Hebrews puts it this way, the New Testament nowhere teaches that an initial acceptance of the saving message is sufficient without perseverance in faith. Apostasy would constitute a rejection of a clear word from God. No one can make the excuse that revelation was not sufficiently certified so that doubts were permissible. Uh, another commentator remarks, warnings are not designed to rob people of hope, but to steer them away from danger in order to preserve them so they might persevere and inherit what has been promised. Jesus came with a message of salvation that's supposed to keep us on the right path. MacArthur warns, drifting is so quiet, easy, but damning. All you need to do to go to hell is nothing. So Jesus came to meet us with a message of salvation. What does that message do? It keeps us on the right path. Folks, I, I can't tell you all the things that you need to do in order to be faithful as a follower of Jesus but I can tell you the most important thing you can do to be faithful as a follower of Jesus is to adhere to the message of salvation. Let God's Word permeate your lives daily, reading Scripture, studying it. That's why our Sunday school classes are around Scripture. Our discipleship groups are around Scripture. Our worship services are framed by Scripture because we don't want any of us to drift and wonder if salvation was ever really real at all. Jesus meets us with the message of salvation. Let me tell you a second truth. Jesus meets us where we are. This next section, verses 5 through 10, is a fascinating section of Hebrews 2. Uh, 
the writer takes us back to the Old Testament, quotes from Psalm chapter 8, which is a beautiful psalm that reflects on the glory of God's creation as witness to him being creator. And then it testifies to the glory of man's, man as being a unique part of creation. And we are unique. Humankind is utterly unique. We have been made in God's image. Psalm 8 tell, <laughs> tells us, and it's quoted here, that man has been made just a little lower than the angels. Uh, we are physical beings. We have the ability to, with free will, yet we're fallen beings, a little lower than the angels. Angels serve God, serve God in heaven. They're immortal beings, and so we're a little lower. But there's a unique blessing about humans that is not given to angels. Angels are servants. They are never given a place of authority and honor, ever, in the Scripture. Their role in heaven is, is to declare God's praise and to worship God and honor Him. But what you're going to find about mankind is those that follow God and are part of His kingdom will reign in heaven. Revelation 4 and 5, the 24 elders are sitting on what? Thrones, reigning with God. This text, Psalm 8, tells us that mankind will have everything put in subjection under His feet. Meaning that man, God's creation, will rule over this earth, this sphere, this thing that God has made. And yet when we look around us, is that really what we see? Do we see humankind fulfilling the glory of the expectation in Genesis chapter 1 where we're to be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth and fill it and rule over it? No, we see all sorts of wicked, unrighteous examples and illustrations of what man is doing to try to control where we live. Greed and self-absorption and pride and arrogance and idolatry. And we can go on down the list. And that was true 2,000 years ago when the writer of the book of Hebrews penned these words. Here's why that should encourage us. Because Jesus came to meet us not where we should be. Because if he came to meet us where we should be, we wouldn't ever be there. Jesus came to meet us where we are. He came to us in the place of our flaws and the place of our failures. He came to us in the place of our shortcomings. When Jesus came to meet you and bring you into a saving relationship with himself, he didn't come to meet you in the place where you were okay, where you were fine, where everything was going well. He came to meet you where you are. And he embraced and embodied that very idea. Look at verse 10. For it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory, that is bringing people into the family of God. That's a wonderful thought at Christmas. We're a part of God's family. That he should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. That word founder uh, carries with it the idea of beginner. Probably the, the clearest translation for us, though, would be the word pioneer. In other words, Jesus is the one who trailblazed for us. He pioneered our salvation. He was the first one down the path. He was the, the one who didn't need salvation, not in the sense that he earned it for himself, but he bought salvation because he fulfilled the, the expectations that God had given to all the human race. And one of the things the book of Hebrews does so well is it takes us back to the Old Testament, the law, the sacrificial system, the rituals and rites of the Old Testament. And those were shadows and foreshadowings and types of what God was going to do to bring about salvation. They weren't means of themselves to get us saved. They were uh, illustrations and affirmations that no matter how we tried to abide by them, we weren't going to ever get there. So what Jesus did is he came down and he was the perfect priest and he's the perfect sacrifice, and he's the perfect law keeper. He's greater than Moses. He's greater than the prophets. He's greater than the, all the Old Testament. So what is Jesus doing? He's trailblazing. He is showing us the way. He is the pioneer of our salvation. And in order to bring about our salvation, he didn't just show us perfection and say, step in the steps that I take. He didn't just say, here's what it looks like to live perfect before God. Now, Come on behind me and you live perfect before God. Now, what does it say? That he should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. This should fascinate us. It should cause us to tremble. 
Jesus does not need perfection. He's the very embodiment of perfection. He never sinned. He's absolutely complete before God. Righteous on the inside and his motivations. Righteous on the outside and his behaviors. Perfect. How then was he made perfect? He was made complete through suffering. I you to get this. In order for Jesus to pioneer our salvation, he had to meet us where we are. And where we are is in a place of suffering. Jesus identifies with us in his saving work, not at our best. He didn't come to redeem you when you were at your nicest. Let me make a confession for just a second. Sometimes stress does negative things in our home, and it stirs up frustrations with my kids, and, and, and sometimes I don't handle that all that well. Sometimes I raise my voice and, and I allow the stress of circumstances to, to govern how I react to my kids. And I have to apologize to them way more often than I'd like. But there are some days, you know, I feel like I'm doing a great job as a parent. Man, it's, it, everything's smooth. Jesus didn't come to save me in the good days, the good moments, when I'm at my best. He came to save us when we were at our worst. He identified with us through suffering. Mike Mason, a commentator, puts it this way, and I want you to just hear this quote. In Jesus, the centerpiece of the human race, the wild tangent of all the frayed and decrepit flesh of this fallen old world touches perfectly the circle of eternity. Jesus comes down, and hear this, he doesn't just meet us where we are. He meets us in our place of suffering, and he went through suffering to show that he meets us in our place of suffering. Some of you are having a hard time. That's okay. We all have hard times, hard struggles, hard moments. I just want you to know that's where Jesus is. That's where he came. He came to meet us in those moments and situations because he faced them as well. He came to meet us where we are. Jesus came to meet us with a message of salvation that should encourage all of us because anyone can hear the message of salvation. He came to meet us where we are. That's good news. He's not expecting us to get to him. And then thirdly, Jesus came to rescue us from our enemies. He didn't just come to meet us. He didn't just come to bring us in his family. He came to bring us in his family by rescuing us from our enemies. Pick up in verse 11. For he who sanctifies and those who sanctified all have one origin. That's why he's not ashamed to call them brothers. And then he says, I will tell of your name in the midst of your congregation. I'll sing your praise. This morning in my devotions, I read Zephaniah 3 which is that text I referenced a few weeks back where God sings. I don't think there's any irony, at least in my own life, that God let me read a text where the Father sings and read this text where Jesus sings in the same day as a reminder that, folks, when we come and gather in praise and worship, Jesus is right here amongst us, congregating with us, assembling with us, singing praise to the Father with and through us. So just as a reminder, when we praise in just a moment, sing, because Jesus is singing too. Then in verse uh, 14, notice this, since therefore, this is our scripture memory verse for the month, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, that's us, we share in flesh and blood. The word share there is the Greek word koinonia. It's fellowship. You and I are flesh and blood. This is what we share. And this is part of who we are. We're frail. We're mortal. We suffer. Since we share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook. Now, partook is not the same as koinonia. Koinonia is that that's a part of who we are. Our flesh and blood is part of who we are. But the word partook that the writer uses here is that Jesus took on, he grabbed a hold of something that was not his by nature. Okay? So God is not flesh and blood. He's not always been flesh and blood. God is spirit. And in eternity past, Jesus was not flesh and blood. So what Jesus did, in order to bring about our salvation, he took a hold of what was not his by nature and made it his nature in order to bring about salvation. He chose, in other words, flesh and blood. He chose difficulty and suffering and sadness and challenge and, and limitations and pain 
He chose all of that. Why? So that through death, Jesus came, shared in flesh and blood, that's the incarnation, so that he might partake of our flesh, so that he might die, in order that he might defeat death. That's a beautiful affirmation, folks. So we think about Christmas, we think about life. Baby being born. Life, it's a beautiful, beautiful, glorious thing. We don't often think about death, but Jesus didn't come to live. Jesus didn't come to do miracles. He didn't just come to teach lessons and preach sermons. He didn't just come to walk on water, heal the sick, and raise those who were lame. Jesus came to die. Because our greatest enemy is death. Notice what he says there. To destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. So we have some several enemies, and I'm not going to go into the detail of talking about all of them. The devil is one of them. He hates you and he hates me. And one of the reasons we need to be in God's Word is the devil just wants us to drift. The devil wins when we drift away from God. The devil wins when we walk away from God. The devil wins when we allow sin into our lives. The devil wins when we allow the fear of today and tomorrow and the fear of death to control us. Jesus came to destroy him. He doesn't have power anymore. He's going to be defeated ultimately. That's what the book of Revelation tells us. To des destroy the one who has the power of death, verse 15, and deliver, that's us, all those who through the fear of death were subject to a lifelong slavery. I don't want to die. I don't think any of you do as well. We're not in a hurry for that. Many of us, though, have been touched by death. Loved ones, friends, family members, moms, dads, husbands, wives, been touched by death. But we don't have to be afraid of death because Jesus already walked that path. Jesus already experienced that event. We don't have to be afraid. Christian, one of the most glorious truths about Christmas is that because Jesus came in human flesh and suffered in human flesh and died in human flesh and then rose again in a glorified, wonderful estate, you and I don't have to be afraid of death. We don't have to be afraid of what our loved one went through. Now, certainly the experiences that take us there, the pain, the suffering, the illness, the disease, the tragedy, the catastrophe, all of that, none of that is to be longed for. But Jesus came to take away the fear of it. Folks, you and I don't have to suffer with death, with the fear of death, because Jesus came to defeat it. John Piper puts it this way, beautiful statement. He said, so we are free from the fear of death. God has justified us. Satan cannot overturn the decree. And God means for our ultimate safety to have an immediate effect on our lives. He means for the happy ending to take away the slavery and fear of the now. If we do not need to fear our last and greatest enemy, death, then we do not need to fear anything. We can be free. Free for joy free for others. What a great Christmas present from God to us and from us to the world. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to let those hovering or undercurrent of fears that so paralyze us. We don't have to let that rule us. Jesus came to take those fears away. Folks, he came to give us joy, life, everlasting life that we can share with others. Folks, that's a supernatural thing that only God can do through His Holy Spirit. And He did by this. Look at what He continues to say. For surely it's not angels that He helps. He helps us. Therefore, He had to be made like His brothers in every respect so that He might become a faithful high priest in the service of God it, to make propitiation. That is, to, uh, to, to stand in, in our stead, to accept the wrath of God for our sins so that our sins could be paid for. Verse 18, for because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. What's the point? Jesus could not help us from heaven. He had to help us by walking in human flesh on earth. He had to become God incarnate. He had to meet with us. I give credit 
for this story to Paul Harvey, uh, and you know the rest of the story, incomparable um, voice. He tells a story years ago uh, of a particular gentleman who, who just could not buy the incarnation. He couldn't. He couldn't buy all the stories that were told at Christmas about Jesus coming in human flesh. So he looked at his wife on Christmas Eve, and he said to her, I'm not going with you to church. I feel like I would be dishonest. I don't believe in the incarnation, so there's no way. I'm not going. He said, I'll stay home. I'll wait up till you get finished, till you come back home, but, but I'm not going. So she left. He stayed there. He was doing some work in the kitchen, cleaning up and stuff, and snowstorm started, and just pouring, pouring the snow. All of a sudden, as he was looking out, listening to the snow, he heard some thuds. He thought somebody was throwing snowballs. Um, he looked out his bay window, and it happened to be birds that, that were caught in this massive snowstorm that were flying into his bay window, obviously trying to get out of the weather. And, uh, and so he thought, I've got to do something to help these birds and rescue them. And he remembered his barn, and so he put on his galoshes and all his snow outfit, and, and he went out and opened his barn door and turned the light on and, and tried to encourage the birds into the, into the barn. Of course, they wouldn't go. So he got some bread, went back inside, got some bread, got some other food, and tried to create a pathway from where the birds were to the barn. And, and of course, the birds didn't follow the pathway. And then he decided, well, maybe I'll shoo them in. So he, he started waving his arms and pushing them. And of course, when he did, they scattered. They wouldn't go into the barn. He thought to himself, if only I could be a bird because they're afraid of me. When he thought that thought, he heard the Christmas bells at the church where his family was celebrating Christmas and fell to his knees recognizing that that's exactly what God did for us. He came in human flesh so that we could hear his message, so that we would know he feels our pain, so that he could defeat our enemies, so that we could experience salvation. Christian, I hope the message of Christmas encourages you this season. If you're not here, or if you're here and you're not a believer in Jesus, I hope that this message invites you to meet the one who came in human flesh to be your Savior, and to be your Redeemer. Stand with me, if you will. Father, we come to you. We thank you for meeting us. We thank you for coming in human flesh for our salvation. We thank you, Lord, for suffering. Lord, I know as I look out across our congregation, as I think about those that are at home watching this morning, I know there are so many who are facing fears, who have experienced a measure of suffering that to some eyes and some ears would be unfair. Lord God, I'm just thankful that as we gather and study Hebrews 2, you came and you suffered where we suffered. You came to meet us at our place of lack and where we fall short. I pray, Lord, that you'd encourage us with that. Help us know you. Help us pay attention to your word. Help us to remain faithful. Lord, for those that don't yet know you, I pray that you'd bring them to salvation. In Christ's name, amen. We're glad to have you worship with us online today. If you'd like to learn more about following Jesus or you'd like more information about Wilkesboro Baptist Church, visit our website, wilkesborobaptist.org, or you can email us, info at Again, thank you for worshiping with us.